Hi everybody, today we're going to do a tutorial on the early access copy of the Grape Juice Isometric plugin for Foundry VTT. So we're going to go step by step through what you're going to need to know how to do in order to use the features that are in the early access. And I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody builds and maybe put screenshots of in Discord. Uh, I think it's going to be really exciting. Before I get into it, I wanted to thank some of the creators that supplied art assets here so that we get this tutorial out really quickly. There's a bunch of people out on Patreon making some pretty cool stuff. So Goalie52 made this 3D rendered uh, beginning of the Death House scene. If you didn't know, Death House is a pretty famous uh, first level adventure for, um, I guess, people in, in the Ravenloft or Curse of Strahd campaign. Also, uh, thank you to Isometric Worlds, who is making sort of hand-drawn, more cartoonish isometric drawings. Uh, and we're using these for a lot of the tokens that we're doing. So thank you to those uh, that put these out. Uh, I think YouTube requires me to say that I'm not sponsored or paid by any of these. They're just, you know, Patreon creators and uh, they, were, they were nice enough to supply their stuff. So thank you. So what are we gonna cover? We're, we've done the Death House tease. We've kind of shown what it looks like when it's put together but we're also going to go through uh, this tutorial. So first I'm going to show what's in the shared folder of assets that we're going to uh, uh, have available in our server. I'll, I'll provide like a Dropbox link or, or something like that down below. Also, uh, I'm gonna go through a fresh install, uh, creating a new world from scratch, uh, showing what modules I turn on for the way that I create maps, uh, but none of those modules are required. And then we're gonna set up a new map we're going to work with tokens. We're going to work with some of the measurement controls, which now work perfectly in isometric, which is pretty awesome. That's one of the big, big benefits of this. And then we're going to learn about some of the extra features that Grape Juice has put in related to walls and doors. These are sort of uh, extra features that we didn't think we would get when, with just an isometric grid, but it solves some of the problems that you're going to run into when you have terrain obscuring what's behind a wall or you open a door and you need to be able to interact with what's behind it and see it because there might be stuff immediately behind the door in an isometric map. And then having all those tools and having all those skills, we'll revisit the death house just for a bit to show how it's all put together uh, so that if you wanted to recreate uh, at some point with the death house, you'd have, you kind of understand how I put that all together. All right, let's get into it. I'm SSH'd into my Linux server here. And I'm going to, uh, you know, Foundry is running, but I'm just going to show, you know, in my local, uh, where is it? In my dot local share Foundry data folder, there's a, a bunch of folders. I have uh, my compendium and my Foundry Dropbox folder shared in there with symbolic links so that if I make a change here on my Macintosh laptop, it, it'll reflect over in my little Linux server box so that you know, if I just make a change in Photoshop or make a change in some art editor, uh, I can get those new tokens and new maps in there really quickly. But the when you install the plugin, it's the same as installing sort of an offline plugin that's not in the official Foundry registry, but it's gonna go in that modules folder. So I go into the modules and I see all the things that I am, you know, maybe have installed for other worlds. Those don't necessarily have to be involved here, but if I go and find the grape juice isometrics, right? So grape juice isometrics is installed right there. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to unzip the folder or, you know, unzip the compressed file that we get from grape juice during this uh, early access and then put it into this folder as a, as a subfolder. And then if I, if I just look inside what's in there, there's only two files. There's main.js and module.json. But if I do a word count on this, number of lines, main.js. It's 2000 lines of code. So it's it's pretty gnarly in there. I you know I wouldn't necessarily say that anybody needs to read it to use it, but just to understand a module is, is, is a relatively small amount of stuff. So you're not dragging in any crazy assets or things. The assets are gonna come in, you know, when you bring your art. All right, so let's go create a new world from scratch. Uh, and for that, I'm gonna jump over to Foundry. And I'm gonna create a world. I'm going to call this the tutorial and I'm going to pick D&D 5th edition, but nothing I'm doing here is going to be particularly 5th edition specific. I just, that's the only system I have loaded because that's the game that I play. And I'm going to say, you know, the tutorial for the folder that it's going into, and I'm going to create the world. 
And so I'm gonna launch that world and jump in as the game master. And here I am, the game's paused, it's applying a bunch of stuff. But first let's go through and I'm going to manage my modules and turn on a bunch of stuff. So because that folder uh, is dropped in here, and, and create this new world. It, it goes and looks inside that folder to see, hey, what modules do I think are good and in there? So the first one, obviously, that I wanna turn on is the grape juice isometrics. So I'm gonna click on that. But just because I'm gonna be doing some map creation here, and my, my hands have some muscle memory for the modules that I use to make map creation quicker, I'm gonna turn on some of the ones that I'm used to. So I'm gonna turn on arms reach that allows me to uh, hit the E key to uh, make doors easier to open without having to use my mouse. Uh, I'm going to do, let's see what else. I also want deselection because when I'm making maps, it's really easy, you know, quick to need to deselect tokens and things. Um, you know, I'm going to turn on dice so nice just to because it works and it's pretty. Um, and I'm going to turn on drag upload because I want to be able to move in assets really quickly. Uh, maybe when creating new tokens or something, I don't want to have to, in this tutorial, do full character setups. That's not super important. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to turn on something called layer hotkeys so that I can really quickly switch to the wall and uh, tile layers in the way that my muscle memory remembers. And because I'm going to be doing some customization of module settings really quickly, I'll turn on tidy UI game settings. So I save those, it reboots the server, and I'm going to go in and configure my modules. This is just, just me doing my, I, I almost do this with every world I have to create. So I configure arms reach so that it's doing the E key for opening doors. I'm going to do it at distance 1.5 so I can do it in a diagonal in an isometric grid. And then I am turning the interact, double tap interaction to zero because I don't want to use that feature. So that's good there. Dice so nice is fine. Tidy UI. All right. So that should be good to go. So now I'm going to go into the scenes and I'm going to create a new scene. But first, I want to show you the assets that we're going to be using while we're building all of this. Put out this top folder worth of assets here. This is stuff that I just cooked up really quickly in Photoshop. Maybe I'll do a tutorial later on how to make quick isometric type assets in Photoshop. Uh, but I have a door, I have a you know five foot by five foot cube, and then I have that same cube again, but with 50% transparency turned on, which will be useful for something we'll show up coming up later. And then I've got a simple full, uh, floor in isometric diagram here uh, that, that all uses the background image for sort of a you know real quick tutorial scene. And then down here, I've got some isometric worlds uh, assets. I've got a, a rogue and I've got a bridge troll. Uh, I, you know, I can't redistribute these, but maybe they'll be made available or you know, they're on the Patreon. Um, but any isometric assets will do. I just wanted to have one that was of medium size, so taking up one grid square. And then I also wanted to have one that was gonna take up multiple grid squares because it's a you know, large creature. So that, that that's what I'm gonna do for this first part of this tutorial. All right, so you'll need to make sure that some of these are available if you're gonna be dropping them as tiles. Like they'll have to be available on the server. Um, but you can also use the drag upload if you're gonna use them as tiles or actors, uh, which I'll do just for the tokens, just to show how that works. So I'll put these off to the side, but I'll be using them when I drag and drop. This one, these are loaded on the server, so I'll, I'll just close these. So I'm gonna create a new scene. So I go down into the scenes and I create a folder. Oh, well, I guess I'll just create a scene instead. I'll create a scene and we'll call this, you know, the, the tutorial world. Kind of see this as like that scene in the Matrix where they're like, I need lots of guns, right? And it's sort of like a virtual loading room. That, that's what this is. So when I have the background, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna browse in to where in my world I put my tutorial folder. So here's the same folder with the, the things that we were just seeing to prove that here they are. So I'm gonna click the background image and I'm gonna select the file. And then right here, there's an enable isometric mode. So I'm gonna leave the grid type on square, but I'm gonna enable isometric mode. And then I'm just gonna go down and hit save changes. So now you'll, when you zoom out, you'll notice something. And it's that it places the background image in kind of a weird place. This is something that might change before you know the actual plugin launches, but right now in the early access, uh, this 
shows up in a kind of a strange place. So we're gonna have to go play with the settings to bring it back over into the middle, but I'll show you how to do that. So I'm going to configure the settings again, and then right to the right of the grid type is this little measurement tool. And that's gonna bring up the grid configuration tool. It turns the grid red, so it's easier to see on top of something that might be the same color, and then you can change the settings. So right away, I'm gonna try and reposition it by making some big grid offset position changes. So I'm gonna move this, you know, let's try 2000 up. That's pretty good. Maybe, maybe it's closer to 1500. And then grid offset position to the left, minus 800. I just wanna get it so that every single one of the grid tiles in my background image is covered by the red grid of Foundry. The reason I wanna do that is because I can't actually position a token or use the, the wall tool or do a lot of Foundry-like things unless I'm operating on this red grid, on the actual grid of Foundry. So just because I can place a background image on it doesn't mean it's actually usable in game. So I wanna make sure that the playable area of my background image is entirely inside this grid here. In Foundry, I'm, I'm in Foundry 0.6.6, wants to make, uh, always gives you a little bit of extra room on the size related to the background image. And that's why I made the background image a little bit bigger than the, the base grid of the playable area, just so that it gave me some more space. So once I do that, I can zoom in and I can see that, oh wow, the, uh, the grid here is too big. Now I made this grid, so I know that that grid is of a size 64. So now that is perfect, it's just not offset correctly. You could go and tweak these individually, but why do that when you can click here and then just use the arrow keys on your keyboard to position this perfectly. And because I made this grid, and I know it's exactly 64 pixels, um, well, it's gonna fit perfectly. There's no, there's no breaking, right? This is actually a perfect isometric grid, so there should be no rounding error. So that, that, that is good to go. So I commit the changes, and there it is, right? I've got my background image overlaid perfectly on this grid. Next step, let's go and drag in a token so that we can see that the token is moving correctly. So I've got that drag upload feature turned on, but you can just as easily create an actor and load up the artwork the way that you're used to. But with the kind of actor area here selected, I'm going to drag the rogue onto the map. And when I do that, it asks me, and this is, this is actually the drag upload module, not the isometric module. It says, do you want a character, an NPC, a vehicle, or an actualist? I'm gonna go for a character because I want it to have all the vision settings turned on. So you see it does that and it places the tile, or it places the, uh, you know, this actor here. So if I go into the actor tab here, you'll see that it created an actor of the name that is the same as the JPEG image. So I, that's a lame name. So let's just call this, you know, red hero, right? And let's go into the prototype token and make sure it is also called red hero. And you know, this is a protagonist here. So we're gonna make it friendly and I'm gonna make sure that the vision is turned on uh, and I don't need dim vision just right yet, but let's do that. So I'm gonna delete this version of them and drag over this version of them. And you're gonna see it's a really dark scene. While we're learning, I'm actually going to turn on global illumination. The lighting in Foundry 6, they say it's gonna change a lot in future versions. Um, some of the lighting plays with the tricks that Grape Juice did to get walls to appear and disappear into the background. So for a lot of these isometrics, you may find that you get a lot out of having global illumination turned on, especially when you're first getting going. Uh, just to, while you're learning, I, I do recommend doing that. Just eliminate variables. So here I've got my guy and I can use the arrow keys. And now when I hit up, it moves in sort of this dimension. When I go left and right, it moves in this dimension. So the up and down and left and right is skewed because we're now we're working in isometric. Maybe that's something they change later, maybe it's not. It took a little while for my brain to, to do that mapping, but it didn't take too long. So this is good, right? This is perfect, this is exactly what we wanted. And the cool part about it is if I, you know, when I drag, you see he kind of leaves isometric for a little bit when I'm moving him, but I drop him and he pops right back into isometric. All right, so I can see what square I'm gonna drop him on. But if I uh, command drag, 
right, and move them around, you're gonna see that the measurement is perfect. It's perfect in this dimension, it's perfect in this dimension, and it's perfect in the diagonal dimensions. So it is perfect, you know, isometric for the type of grid that you're doing. Now, I mean, honestly, if you're not, if you're playing a grid that doesn't have this, because it's still using this existing system, if I say, I actually am playing like a, a hex game, right? Where the game, where the controls are in hex. Hey, you know, it still works and it's still skewed so that the isometric art will be perfect. That's, that's hot. That's, that's a kind of an interesting effect of isometric and the grid being a little bit separate. Uh, so I'm gonna put that back into square mode and I probably messed up. No, the offset's still great. All right, perfect. Next, let's get into what it's like to have a large creature, like a monster, and see how that works. So I'm going to go back to my tokens here, and I'm going to drag in the troll. I'm going to make it an NPC, because it's sort of like a monster, and I'm going to go and edit it a bit. So I'm going to go bridge troll. I'm going to go into the prototype token and call it a bridge troll. And it is definitely hostile. It doesn't need vision because it's not a monster. It's a monster. But if I go into the image here, if I change the width and height and say, I want it actually to take up two grid units by two grid units, that's going to make it a bigger monster. That sort of makes a lot of sense in the world of D&D. It may not make as much sense in, in other game systems, but I think you'll see from the effect that you're getting what you want. So I update that, close it, and I'll delete this instance of the token and drag it back. And now here we have a big boy, right? A monster taking up a two by two grid. Now I've tested the uh, the hex sizing, you know, helper uh, module with the isometric, and it still works. So you could modify the offset and kind of shift this around in in this square if you wanted to. But honestly, just for speed, I'm getting pretty good use just out of using the, the default straight out of straight out of the isometric tool. The next thing I want to show, because I want to show the player view side by side, uh, I'm going to go in and for red hero, I guess, you know, I have to go and this is a brand new scene. So I'm going to configure players. I'm going to create additional user called test PC, uh, make them a trusted player. And then I'm going to go back in as the GM on this tab, incognito tab. But I'm going to go to Red Hero. I'm going to configure permission. I'm going to give the test player ownership of this. So as I go through here in the incognito tab, players on the right, I have control over it. And that's going to be important for what I'm doing next, which is as the player, I want to maybe cast a spell on this troll. So let's say it's a like a fireball or something a 20 foot radius all i gotta do is drop it down here right and now i've got an isometric radius applied uh and it, you notice that it's perfect right uh it, it is actually 20 feet in in the grid dimensions and so it's gonna be really easy to kind of use your spells and use your area effects i've tested this with some of the uh kind of animated effects and things and, and the ones that are just affecting the base layer uh, work pretty well. So your, mi your mileage will vary depending on any extra things you're doing for sort of animated and special effects here. Uh, but the core foundry stuff is working fantastically. So the ability to go and say, do a, do a lightning bolt, right? Or do a uh, burning hands, right? Let's do, let's do a cone spell. So burning hands is what's at 15 feet, something like that. Right, so I could go and have a, a burning hands go out and affect a lot of monsters. So that's that's pretty awesome, right? This is something that you could not do, uh, frankly, in any virtual tabletop anywhere, uh, with modules or without. This is the first time, to my knowledge, that we've been able to do this with virtual uh, virtual tabletop tools. So that's a, that's a pretty big achievement. All right, so I'm going to as the DM go and clean up these measure templates and let's move on. So I'm gonna sort of move this screen over. So the next thing I wanna do is show how 
to set up walls and obstacles so that the player can walk in front of them and see the obstacle, but also walk behind them and miss the obstacle. Uh, and you have the obstacle taken away. Okay, next we are going to look at some of the terrain features that have been added to the isometric. So I'm gonna drag over my five foot cube and I'm gonna show the problem. So one, just a note in case you didn't know this, when you drag tiles, they, they don't only stay exactly where you put them because they're trying to snap to the grid. You're gonna wanna learn, especially when doing kind of precision placement, that if you hold the shift key and then drag it and then let go, it, it leaves it exactly where I want it. So the problem here is that maybe this, this troll is hiding behind this cube. Well, tokens always get rendered and drawn by Foundry on top of the tiles. Tiles are underneath tokens always. Uh, that, that's the current behavior of Foundry in 0.6.6. So that's, you know, that's not great for interacting with terrain. I would prefer the troll to be able to sort of move behind in some cases, but then move above in other cases. So that that's not what I want. So the thing that's been added to uh, Foundry by the isometric plugin is gonna help with this. Let me show what we were doing before. I would go into walls and I would make like a terrain wall. And then I would get some of the behavior that I want. This is more about dynamic lighting. So I would go and I would click on this and I, I could still see this and it would obscure and hide the token maybe, but still like, let's put myself here, right? When I'm, when I am the, you know, this, I'm still being rendered on top. So it's still unclear. Is he, is he in front of this thing? Or is he behind this thing? What's going on? So let's solve that. So I'm going to go back to the walls. I'm going to delete that, those walls. And then I'm going to set up a different type of wall. So I'm going to instead use this new feature of the plugin and I'm going to create a normal wall at the base. Just the base like that. And then I'm going to click on this tile, double click on it, and you're going to see two new things. There's has door on open, we'll mess with doors later, and there's attach asset to wall. That's the one that I'm going to use. So when I click attach asset to wall, it brings up the wall, you know, markers and it lets me mouse over and you see they kind of highlight to show which one I'm selecting. When I click it, up comes the ID of that wall and I can click the wall thing again to go pick a second wall. You see it puts a comma and then there's the second wall. And now both of these are going to help the, the render decide, depending on which token selected, whether or not to show the to the uh, this tile on top. So I'm gonna update the tile and show what happens. So here, now, when I'm in front, I'm in front. And when I'm somewhere where I can reasonably, I should be behind this thing, it disappears. So it's a little bit more like a video game where the foreground elements disappear so that I can see behind and know what I'm stepping on. You know, maybe there's a pit trap back there. Uh, maybe I can use this to hide, you know, dynamically hide uh, stuff in the train. Maybe I can use it for stuff other than, than obstacles. Let me show another thing that I do to make this more clear to my players. Remember how I had a 50% version of that tile around? Well, what I can do is I can, well, one, make sure that one tile renders underneath the other one. So I'm gonna want the transparent, the mostly transparent one to be underneath. And then I'm gonna drag it so that it matches pretty perfectly to where that is, holding the shift key and leaving it and then walk away. All right now, check out what happens. All right, I've got this transparent version of it, so it looks like it just gets dimmed a bit. I'm gonna use that trick a lot. <laughs> That's a, I, sometimes I'll take the transparent version and, I'll, and when I'm making the base map, I'll just cook that in in Photoshop and leave it there as a guide as to where I wanna put my doors and walls that are solid. So that, and that's a pretty handy trick there uh, that you can use for a lot of things, especially when you have like a, almost like a room that might have another room right next to it. Just making the whole foreground room, uh, in, you know, one of these walls can, can be a great trick. All right, let's get a little bit fancier here and set up a door. So quickly, I'm going to set up another one of these. I'm gonna set up another one of these. I'm gonna go in here. Uh, let me just 
place this separately. I'm going to create some walls. Get this player out of the way. I'm going to click here really quickly. Click the two base walls of this, update. Now I'm going to move it perfectly, just so I don't have to mess with the things when they're stacked on top of each other. So now I should have two of these. Just want to zoom out a little bit so it's not re-scrolling everywhere. I got two of these that I can stand behind, which is kind of neat. I can even move between them, right? Uh, now it lets me move in them. I don't like that. I don't. I'm not supposed to be able to stand inside of those things. So let me mess with that a bit. Sorry for the construction. I live in a city, and I guess I can take an invisible wall and extend these to stop somebody from walking in. All right. So now. Yeah, that's perfect. Now I can't walk in. That's what I wanted. Uh, another fun trick to look at is that, uh, and this is a neat thing that we added. This is the height. If I enter five feet, now he's flying five feet above. All right, so if you had like a winged creature or something, that would work perfectly. Right, that's the way that's supposed to work. I don't know if you could combine this with the height walls thing to get it to do something different with the walls. I haven't tried that yet, but that's a neat feature. All right, now let's do the door. So I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna drag in my door. I'm gonna place the door perfectly. So there's a door in between these two little blocks and I'm going to go into the walls area. I'm going to create just a normal door and span that normal door right there. So this is very similar to how I build a build a scene in, in top down. But when I go to the tile and I double click and I click the door, let me just make sure this is drawing correctly. Sometimes I have to go click on a token to get the door icon to show up. So in here, I go and I click the door. And I'm also going to use it as a wall so that it kind of understands that it's obscuring the terrain. And then I'm going to hit update tile. And now I go, let's move this troll behind here and let's clear the fog of war. And here I am. I have no idea there's a troll, but I move up to the door, open it. And now I can see the troll behind. Close the door. Right, and that door appears and disappears. Sometimes I'll do the 50% transparency thing for the door too, so that when I run up from this side and the door is closed, I understand why the door is closed. Well, I guess I can see it in the icon, but that's pretty nice. So let's clear the fog of war again. Let's do that on the player screen. So here's the player. Let's clear the fog of war. Come on. Oh, I guess the door's open, so that's not gonna be helpful. Clear the fog of war. Never been to that part of the map. Right? There's no troll, clearly no troll. Open it up. Now I can move through. When it's not open, I can't move through. Right? So now I've got an isometric door that works a lot more how I expect it to behave. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna be able to use these techniques for lots of different things, not just doors. So that, that's pretty exciting. All right. Um, and then, you know, just because it's D&D, &D, back and, you know, throw a lightning bolt or something. Get a line. All right, boom, perfect. All right, that is so cool. Okay, so we're back to here. We're back in the Goalie 52 death house scene from Curse of Strahd. And this is the same techniques that we've learned. So I'm gonna pull apart this scene. I'm gonna show sort of behind the GM curtain and show how this is put together. First, let's look at the walls. So I've got this row house set up. This is a door. This is a door that you can see through. So that's a door, but then I've turned off the perception restriction because it's a screen grate. Uh, I've got some just stop people from walking through them walls, uh, but there's a, a couple of tiles here that we should pay attention to. So first off, I'll just deselect. There's a tile for this wall right here. I'm gonna move it back really carefully. So 
So a lot of fine placement. All right. There's a there's a wall for that. There's a wall here for this. There's the front wall here. These are all the walls that a player can walk behind. That's the key thing. You want to make sure you grab all the walls that a player can walk behind. And they're all strung up, attached to the walls that are at their base. And I guess I just messed that one up. Is there an undo button? I feel like there should be an undo button. All right, there's the undo button. All right, um, same thing for the doors. But you'll notice on this one, this one is actually this, and this is this wall here. This one is actually tied to this wall and this wall, but not the center wall, so that it gets obscured correctly, but also so that it understands that this image, that's this arch, uh, you know, I want to be able to see it until I'm behind it. So that works pretty well. Probably have some seams in there because I just moved it around. Uh, I have to open up the grate to get past it because if I go into the grate here, I'll see that perception is none. That's not a standard door. It's a door, but the perception perception is set to none and the movement is set to normal so that I can't walk through it because it's a grate, it's a fence, but I can hide it like so. And I move in here and you'll see that there's a door uh, that if I go to the tiles, I'll just move apart part of these. When I build scenes, I tend to do it from the back to the front so that I don't have to mess with this stuff. So let's just move that. Let's check with this door, because this door is a little bit more complicated. So let's just move these out. So here, this door is like this, and then it's got another arch in here. I think I might have actually locked, so I didn't move it by accident. So this wall here is tied to the, this yellow and this yellow, and the door is tied to the green. And I have to remember to tie it both as a door and as a wall so that it controls whether it opens and closes and also controls whether or not it is something you can walk behind. All right, and so when I open that, I can go through and it is going to properly hide this arch based on the player, based on whether I'm standing in front of it or behind it. And then for the door, Right, and you know, the door is gonna open and close regardless of where I put it. Right, but when I have it placed correctly, it's gonna it's gonna create this effect that I wanted. So when I place it somewhere correctly like this, now it's gonna open and close correctly. So that's it, right? That's uh aside from throwing more fireballs at uh at trolls because well it's D and D and I've got this muscle reflex, I just have to do it, right? then you're all set. So I'm really excited. Um, we've been waiting for this for a long time. Let me, uh, So I'm really excited. We've been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to see what people make with this, what art assets they pass in. Uh, I've seen people doing really quick sort of voxel creations in the Discord where they're using some isometric art tools to make some quick and dirty, but honestly kind of cool looking isometric scenes that read really well for players. So I'm hoping that having this sort of more native support inside of VTT unlocks a whole world of creative people and creative GMs making maps and playing with them in isometric. I think this is gonna be big. So I look forward to talking to everybody in the Discord sharing your screenshots, seeing what you make, uh, learning about other people who are making cool art assets out there that, that uh, maybe I could use in my game because I don't have a lot of prep time. So it's always great to have other assets. And, and thank you, thanks for being part of the community and thanks for Grape Juice for uh, letting me make this early access video. All right.